Welcome to the politics of identity and social cohesion. We frequently have dealt with the question of how many people should be on a round table. So today inadvertently gives us a good, a good chance to test out the question of intimacy in round tables because two of our panelists who are supposed to be here, one from Johns Hopkins, Mary Haybeck, Hay Haybeck cannot make it today. And Paul Berman uh, just has not shown up yet, but may show up. So if he does, that would be great. Uh, but we have a wonderful panel. And before we begin today's program, I wanted to call your attention to the exhibit on the walls called Hive Web Mind. And like all Philotetes exhibits, when, you, when people walk into Philotetes, they frequently look at the art as decorative because they're concentrated on the panel. But all the exhibits, which are curated by Hallie Cohen, with the help of Adam Ludwig, are related to projects that we've endeavored to pursue. And, one, and this one was related to our recent May 1st panel on social networking, and in particular about Facebook. Um, so uh, take a look at it. And I think it does relate also to today's panel because we have the question of social cohesion. And here in organic form, you see some of the kind of ideas that the cerebral cortex has generated in the course of civilization. Um, Oh, yes. There are nests embedded in the wall, if you notice. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. But you don't have to be afraid. There are no bees. Uh, <laughs> and no pollinization, therefore. Um, the second part of this particular endeavor, exploration of extremism, the politics of ecstasy, takes place on June 3rd. And for that, we have uh, Pearl Abraham, the author of a book called American Taliban, Larry Shainberg, the well-known author of Ambivalent Zen, Jeffrey Shugan Arnold, the abbot of the Zen Center of New York City, and Richard Sloan, who's a professor of behavioral medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. So here today, we're going to be prosecuting political and social social cohesion and identity, and then we deal with kind of extremism on a religious and spiritual level and, and, and the ways in which that affords uh, the social patterns that that generates and the ways that, that affords human social interaction, the positives and minuses of that kinds of those kinds of interactions. Uh, please go to philoctetes.org for a calendar of all our activities. And as you know, all Philoctetes events are simulcast so that people are watching this now on their computers around the world, ostensibly. And also, they are recorded so that you can go to philoctetes.org and go to our archive, past programming. And you can see all Philoctetes events there. And you can also see it on, we have our own site on YouTube. So this will be on YouTube. When will it be? A couple, maybe uh, within about three or four days, it's, it appears on YouTube, where we do get a, an enormous hundreds of thousands of hits for these events. So um, you'll be able to see, see that there. Now, um, in Philoctetes is, is obviously still in existence, but we need your help. Uh, we've, had, we've had great success in, in grant writing and grant getting. Uh, the New York State Council on the Arts has awarded us grants in music and in poetry, the Department of Cultural Affairs, Bloomberg LP. Recently, the Le Leon Levy Foundation renewed their grant to us, and the Templeton Foundation financed our Mathematics and Imagination series, and we're working with them on a whole new set of programs. But we need your help, so uh, if you like our activities, please give to Philip Tates. Uh, now I'm pleased to present Richard Bouliette, who is returning to Philip Tates today. Bullet. Yeah, bullet, sorry. <laughs> uh, Richard Bullet is a professor of history. I think I made the same mistake last time. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, we're in a psychoanalytic institute, so it's a case of repetition compulsion. <laughs> Doesn't mean I don't like you. <laughs> um, professor Bullitt is a professor of history at Columbia University's Middle Eastern Institute. He specializes in Middle Eastern history, naturally, uh, the social and institutional history of Islamic countries, and the history of technology. His publications include The Patricians of Nishapur, A Study in Medieval Islamic Social History, The Camel and the Wheel, Islam, The View from the Edge, The Case for Islamo-Christian Civilization, and the forthcoming Cotton and Climate in Early Islamic Iran. He co-edited the Encyclopedia of the Modern Middle East, co-authored The Earth and Its Peoples, A Global History, and conceived and edited the Columbia History of the 20th Century. Professor Bullitt will moderate this afternoon's panel. Whew, that's a lot of citations, too. I'm getting my breath back. And introduce our other distinguished guests. So take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Frank. It's a pleasure to be back here, even if the pronunciation of my name is still a mystery. Uh, there's a long history to the spelling, which I will, won't go into. 
Uh, I also want to apologize to the people behind me in this, uh, in this particular format. Inevitably, you know, we're going to have that. Um, but we'll try and move the discussion around so everybody gets uh, you know, line of sight. Uh, the, um, the, the, the two colleagues I have here uh, and I will try to uh, form a full uh, round table. Uh, Dan Stetz on my left has been a news reporter and editor for more than 30 years as a Berlin-based correspondent for the Philadelphia Inquirer. In the early 1990s, he covered ethnic cleansing and the wars in the former Yugoslavia. It was actually there as the fighting began. He also covered the persecution of Kurds by Saddam Hussein at the end of the first Gulf War, as well as the conflict between Kurds and Turks in southern Turkey. He is currently the leader of the Energy Markets News Team at Bloomberg News in New York. He joined Bloomberg as an editor in Frankfurt, Germany, in 1998. On my right is uh, my uh, former colleague from the History Department at Columbia Uni University. Isra Wallach is the Moore Collegiate Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, specializing in modern Europe and France. His works include 18th Century Europe, Tradition and Progress, 1715 to 1789, The New Regime, Transformations of the French Civic Order, 1789 to the 1820s, and Napoleon and his collaborators, the making of a dictatorship. So you have a, um, certainly a variety of expertise and experience. And as we were talking before in the green room, we reached a firm consensus, I think it's firm, that we do not know what this is about. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the masterful opacity of the uh, of, the, of the topic paragraph uh, is such that invites us to go in any number of directions, and we will try and go in many directions at once uh, in, in good sort of Alice in Wonderland style. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to start out uh, by making some observations, then we'll uh, go to Dan and Isser and uh, interact with one another, and eventually we will open the floor to questions and comments. Uh, from the audience, but um, first we're going to have a conversation among ourselves, and Frank, of course, uh, you're a part of it too, so, uh, you know, chip in as you, as you wish. Uh, we'll pass it. Yeah, the, 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 the person who stirred the stew. That, uh, the obfuscator, yes. Um, what, what makes this uh, opaque in part is that you get a number of different themes adumbrated but not integrated, so that you have politics of identity. Politics of identity have been developed uh, out, you know, in many ways, but very often it's ethnic identity, uh, but it could be religious identity, uh, uh, you know, linguistic identity, uh, nationalist identity. Politics of identity is an ambiguous topic. And then social cohesion. Uh, is social cohesion something that occurs within a, um, an identity group that's identified with a nation or with an ethnos or with a linguistic group or in some other way or with a religious group. And so with the title, Politics, Identity, and Social Cohesion, um, we're, we're left with, with about as large an umbrella as, uh, as we could wish. Then as we go into the, into the topic, our first word is xenophobia. And, um, of course, xenophobia, uh, you know, implies a politics of identity that is an identity vis-a-vis -vis another, uh, which, and there are other ways to construe identity. Um, uh, and the same thing with social cohesion. It's a cohesion vis-a-vis -vis some other um, uh, social uh, construct. And as we lead, read on, we eventually get to a sentence, how does extreme political ideology grow out of religious thinking in Muslim, Jewish, and Christian worlds. Well, is religion to be centered here? And one of the things I think we've, we've lived through, um, as I look around the room, I discover that a lot of people are like us. We've lived a long time, and we don't have to think of this as an undergraduate uh, audience who barely remember 9-11, uh, if they remember it at all. 
Um, but as in the years that we have lived through, the decades, um, we've really seen uh, extraordinary changes in, uh, in the way in which uh, the, the public at large uh, and the media that, uh, that sort of channel the, uh, the interests and uh, perhaps even program the interests of the public at large, uh, they've had very different uh, stages in thinking about things like uh, identity and social cohesion. Prior to 9-11, uh, religion would not necessarily have been uh, the paramount uh, item. Uh, when you deal with the, uh, with the collapse of Yugoslavia uh, and uh, Croats and Serbs and Bosnians and Kosovars and so forth, uh, whether religion was the, would be the appropriate uh, rubric to talk about identity and social cohesion there is something that I'll, I'll, I'll leave to Dan, but it's not obvious to me that it would be. Um, similarly, if you were to deal with, uh, with certain other parts of the world, uh, the question of what the, the basis of a xenophobia would be would be very would be questionable as to whether religion would come first. You know, I'm thinking, say, of the Tamil uh, versus the Sinhalese uh, division in, uh, in Sri Lanka or the uh, Tutsi and Hutu division in Rwanda. Uh, so religion wasn't necessarily on the front burner prior to 9-11. Since then, uh, it has to some degree come to be on the front burner. And that's where we get the sentence about Muslim, Jewish, and Christian um, uh, sort of uh, roots of, uh, of xenophobia. Uh, and yet it's not clear whether, to me, as a, someone who specializes in the, in the Middle East, in the Islamic world, it's not clear to me whether religion is always the, um, the appropriate uh, uh, rubric to use there. Um, even in Israel? Even in Israel. I think that, well, let me just start it with an example from Israel. Uh, public opinion polls show that 71% uh, of the Israeli public wants the United States to invade Iran. Not, not for Israel to invade Iran, but they want the United States to invade Iran. Um, I've just gotten back from three weeks in Israel where I was on an international committee to review the status of Middle East studies at five different, middle, uh, five different Israeli universities. And one of the striking things that we found was that there's virtually nobody who studies Iran at the Israeli universities, and yet everyone in the political system has Iran uh, at the top of their concern. Uh, you have uh, one near-term retiree and another person at Tel Aviv. You have one person in Ben Gurion, uh, one person in uh, uh, Bar Ilan, uh, one person in, uh, in Haifa, and uh, one or two in Hebrew University, but by comparison, if you look at the number of people who deal with the Arab world, uh, there are lots and lots. But the Arab world isn't seen as the great enemy now. Uh, it, it's Iran. And so the question is, is the, what some uh, Israelis call Iranophobia, is the Iranophobia in Israel uh, the product of, of the sort of consideration that arises out of a serious study of the Islamic Republic of Iran, or is it another kind of, uh, of, of xenophobia that arises out of uh, other factors? I would strongly recommend, for example, a book by a professor uh, at Ben Gurion University, published by Stanford University Press, a professor named uh, Haggai Ram, called uh, Iranophobia, uh, Israel's Obsession with Iran, in which he makes very interesting arguments that I won't try to summarize at this point. But um, well, what we f find parallel to, that, parallel to that in this country is Islamophobia. Uh, it's fairly easy to determine the, um, the, the progress of, of Islamophobia in this country. Uh, the sense that Islam is a, um, if not a terrorist, at least a violent religion that has in its most uh, significant political expressions uh, negative uh, views of Western civilization in the United States. Uh, all you have to do is take, make a list of 
authors who write about moderate Islam and the names of their books, and a list of people who write about the evils of Islam and the list of their books. And then go to Amazon and look at the ranks and sales uh, of them. And you can see that book that sort of hate books about Islam outsell feel-good books about Islam by a, a, a huge, a huge ratio. So that you know what's happening is that uh, again, and this is not in the academic arena where uh, Isra and I have lived our lives, but what is happening is that uh, in other uh, vectors of uh, dissemination of thought and opinion in this country, um, we're building, uh, our society is building a xenophobic attitude toward members of another religion. Okay, these are two examples that happen to be religious, but as I say, if you go back in time, uh, you get very different things. You get a point where nationalism seems to be the, the root of xenophobia or uh, uh, parts of the world where it's um, ethnic or even tribal identity. And so where we're going to go with this, um, I don't know, but Dan does. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to turn to him now and, um, and let him chip in here. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I almost attempted to just ask for a, cold, uh, a show of hands if I should sit here and just tell war stories. That might be more interesting. <laughs> and, um, I, uh, I, I was looking forward, uh, maybe Paul will still come, I was looking forward to what he had to say as in preparation. I sort of picked up his book, The Flight of Intellectuals, which gets into the strains of Islam uh, that ha uh, show um, um, a distinct uh, anti-Semitism and it's sort of the, the sympathy of uh, the liberals and the lack of criticism too. And, and, and basically lack of knowledge is the way I, I interpret what's going on, that there's a lot of issues uh, and a lot of personalities that people are just not sensitive to who they are or where they came from. which sort of brings me to perhaps I'll go and try and talk more about what I saw and what I, I won't pre presume to say what I know, but I can relate what I saw. Um, after 9-11, I mean, some people who had been through the Yugoslav experience or had ties to Yugoslavia, their reaction was, well, where's the surprise? Didn't you know who these people are? Um, we tried to tell you. But that's a pretty extreme point of view, I know. But the um, I ended up spending time. I mean, I was a newspaper reporter who was sent to cover because I spoke German first to cover the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then from there, uh, uh, my editor called me and said, "Can you get into Prague?" So I ended up covering the Velvet Revolution, and then you know those were feel-good events, and the correspondence. Uh, all said these were the last feel good events in you know in Europe after that it got very nasty and um, I ended up being posted to to Germany and um, uh, walking down the street I walked by uh, there's a building on uh, uh, Hungarian a Hungarian literary society and there's a, a little plaque there to uh, Cardinal Menzenti and my introduction to Yugoslavia actually came through Cardinal Menzenti. He was re he, they there was a ceremony in in outside of uh, Budapest where he was uh, reburied. Uh, he brought home, so to speak. He'd been buried in. Um, uh, in, in Austria. It was an interesting event which I was most impressed with. Otto von, von uh, uh, Habsburg was there and I didn't know any Habsburgs were actually alive. I thought that was uh, pretty thrilling. But um, after that, in the, in the strange way of newspapers, my editor said, well, there's this place called Borovo Selo in, in Croatia and why don't you get there? There's shooting. So I ended up um, I had this car, which was a big Opel with Hungarian license plates on it, and I drove down into Croatia and headed for a place called Vukovar. Mm. And I found myself, first of all, cut off and surrounded by, it looked like, you know, like almost like a, a Monty Python scene. These people were surrounding me with guns, all of which looked to be, you know, 50 years old, wondering what I was doing there, especially wondering what I was doing with Hungarian license plates, uh, because I was in a Serbian area, and of course there was 
uh, historic tension there. But um, they sort of figured out I was both uh, harmless and probably not very intelligent. So they let <laughs> me go. And, and then I next found myself uh, in the midst of tanks of the Yugoslav uh, army. And I was like, what is going on here? Anyway, I finally ended up in Vukovar, which, uh, which I think of the place, in my mind at least, where the Yugoslav conflict began, or in a, in a, in a village outside Vukovar called Borovo Selo. And Borovo Selo, uh, what happened in Vukovar was that um, when the Croatians basically be, were moving towards independence, one of the things they, de they desired was that if you were going to stay in Croatia, and particularly if you were a civil servant in Croatia, that you sign a loyalty oath to Croatia. And um, the civil service, I mean, you know, growing up in New York, uh, we always would say, and I have a lot of Irish in my family, that there was always a good job to be in the civil service. So there was a lot of Irish civil service school teachers and whatnot. And the Serbs seemed to, in the former Yugoslavia, a lot of them thought government jobs were a good thing. And so uh, the civil service, uh, these people were not eager to sign oaths, particularly the Serbs who were in the police department. And so they were fired, in effect. And they um, also more or less fired was the mayor of Vukovar, who was a democratically elected Serb. He was told, don't come back, you know, don't come back into town. So there was an incident where uh, the Croats decided to, um, it was more a prank than anything else. A couple of Croatian policemen went one night and erected a Croatian flag, took down the Yugoslav flag, and erected a Croatian flag on a water tower. And they were, uh, they were seen and wounded. Uh, they shot at them. They weren't very badly hurt, but they were wounded and by, the, by the Serbs uh, who were still in the town. And the Croatians called up the regional police and said, we want these guys back. And the uh, Serbs said, great, come and get them. And so they put uh, their policemen in a bus and they drove into this town, this village, Borovoselo, where they had, had the, um, were holding them supposedly. And, and what happened then is really unclear, but that's in essence I think where the war began. The Croats got out of the bus and they were suddenly facing the former police of Vukovar, who were well armed, and a battle ensued, and um, there were more than a dozen Croats killed, and it was basically a massacre. And um, so it was it was the beginning of tensions. But uh, uh, what uh, I guess I bring this up uh, because it was you know there was social identity. I mean, you were excluded if you wouldn't swear allegiance to the new Croatian state and they just refused to do it and it caused conflict. I mean, and there was a cultural divide, obviously. Uh, it wasn't just religion, Roman Catholic uh, versus uh, Eastern Orthodox or Serbian Orthodox. There was a belief, and the, the Croats firmly believed that they were culturally superior. They were Western. Uh, the Serbs were Eastern, sort of more associated with Turks and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there was also the firm belief, and this is why, when I was thinking of this subject, it was what I, what I had thought was, what to me was important about that experience was uh, I drove around that area thinking, they're really not going to do this. They're not going to start a war, are they? They are not going to destroy this country. This can't be true. Because Yugoslavia, among all the Eastern European countries, and I'd been in virtually all of them as a journalist, was the most advanced in a sort of an uh, infrastructure sense and uh, uh, educational sense. It was, uh, and uh, in an economic sense, there were already many factories. I mean, they were on their way. They were a country that should have just slipped right into the EU. I mean, they were ready. Um, and they were intent on destroying it because of this, uh, what first began in um, this conflict, which first began in Croatia, but then obviously spread. My, my background 
um, was my ties were primarily German because I'd studied German and that's why I'd been sent over there. And I thought I was being sent over to be a correspondent, sort of an economic correspondent covering the rebuilding of Germany. I didn't really think that I would end up in, you know, several wars. I mean, in Yugoslavia, I ended up in the, the, the beginning and the end of the Gulf War of conflicts in Turkey. But... Um, you know, it was like kind of puzzling and a little frightening at times. But one of the things, uh, you know, one of my bosses said to me, well, you ought to go and talk to the diplomats. They'll tell you what's going on. So I said, well, I'll go talk to the German diplomats. I, these guys are interesting. And they were, um, it was, I, I think it's a point of view that Americans probably don't have on what happened in Yugoslavia. The, the German diplomats, and this was the professional German diplomats, not you know the politicians like Hans Dietrich Genscher. The professional German diplomats, uh, they're sort of there's sort of a tradition. Many, I mean, there's still a kind of a Prussian tradition. Of these these people are uh, the the funds, and they come from a lot of them, very well educated, as well as you know the other sort of social group. But um, their point of view was was startling to me, they said, there are no good guys here, and everyone is lying. <laughs> everyone is lying. Everyone's got a line, and they're all lying. And you know, why the, how the Muslims are lying, how they're trying to manipulate you, how the Croats are lying, how they're trying to manipulate you. And of course, we know the Serbs are lying, right? Um, and they, they also had a different point of view. On, they were like, they were trying to get the government to control Hans Dietrich Genscher, who was a foreign minister. They kept, the one thing that everyone was afraid of was, and getting back to this theme of social cohesion and identity, there was such a history there of violence. You have to remember that, you know, just go back to World War II, where one of the largest concentration camps and really extermination camps in Europe was in Croatia for Serbs, uh, Jews, gypsies. And the Serbs hadn't forgotten that. What camp is it? Uh, or Jasenovac. It's in Croatia. I, uh, for whatever reason, I've visited a lot of camps. I visited that camp before the war. I've been to Birkenau and Auschwitz. There's a part of Birkenau that's, that was reserved for Serbs as well. I mean, these things that people didn't forget. And of course, there was a Muslim, uh, which one of the things Paul mentions in his book is there's a Muslim uh, a uh, unit that was allied with the Nazis during World War II, and they sort of, so there was this feeling of righteous anger on their part, that we've been wronged, and you know, we've suffered, and, and on, on the part of the Croatians, of course, there was, we'd been wronged, and, and then the Muslims felt like victims, and um, so. Maybe we should move on, because we do have now another member of our round table, um, uh, Paul Berman is a writer in residence at the Arthur L. Carter Institute at New York University. His essays and reviews appear in the New Republic, the New York Times, Book Review, Dissent, and other journals. His books include A Tale of Two Utopias, Power and Idealists, Terror and Liberalism, and most recently, The Flight of the Intellectuals. He's the editor of the Library of America's Carl Sandburg Selected Poems. I'd, we're not talking about Carl Sandburg probably today, but uh, who knows? Uh, before you came, I was uh, suggesting that the, the, the basic opacity of the paragraph that sets our topic for today is such that we can go in almost any direction. So why don't you take us where you think we should go? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I apologize to everyone for being late, um, but I do have a two cents to throw in. Um, um, uh, the, the paragraph introducing uh, uh, our, our discussion uh, refers to the Islamist thinker Syed Qutb, and uh, about whom I've, I've I've written a bit, and I sympathize completely with whoever wrote the paragraph because it's so difficult to get 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 the little factoids cor correct. Um, but I'll correct a, 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 a couple and and then advance uh, from there. Syed Qutb uh, was. Um, Actually, was was hanged uh, by the Egyptian dictator Nasser in 1966. Uh, six, um, oh, not 56. Not 56, right? And um, it might have been better if he'd been hanged in 56. So I don't want to say that's good that <laughs> anybody 
uh, should be hanged, and and <clears throat> but if he was going to be, uh, and 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 he provided the ideology uh, uh, not uh, not for the Wahhabi sect, uh, uh, but but for it's this is a little complicated, but but for the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an Islamist organization in in um, uh, Egypt, which which has uh, branches. Uh, uh, all over the world, all over the Muslim world, um, and <coughs> and and all over the world, uh, which was then promoted by the uh, uh, Wahhabi sect in 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 Saudi Arabia. So uh, these, you know, if you've if you've studied as I have the the eighty seven versions of Trotskyism, uh, <laughs> you, you you have a leg up on 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 on. on uh, Working out the different um, uh, doctrines of, of Islamism. What's very interesting about Syed Qutb and 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 why I and the reason I I think the organizers of this conference have wanted to uh, talk about him in, in, in this context is is that he provides in his writings a a. Uh, uh, a grand mythology, and if you look at his mythology, and you look at some of the other uh, doctrines that have entered into the kinds of wars that we've just heard about, and, and uh, larger wars too, uh, which we've heard about, such as World War, War II, we can recognize, I think, a uh, a sort of meta myth that underlies uh, one modern, modern ideology after another, and has 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 uh, played a a simply gigantic role in in uh, world history uh, during the last hundred years, uh, but did not play uh, an especially large role in uh, the previous century, in the nineteenth century. So it's a it's 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 not exactly a new thing in world history, but it's a modern thing. And uh, this uh, meta myth, I would describe uh, this way. Said so Qutb provides an Islamic version of it, but but it is a myth shared uh, that comes in many versions. It its ultimate origin, I suppose, is uh, is the Bible, and 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 the book of the uh, the book of the Apocalypse. So they could find references to the same myth in, in other. Uh, scriptural uh, writings, <clears throat> Christian, a little bit uh, Jewish, not so much Muslim until uh, recent times. And uh, the myth says there is a people of God. The people of God are under assault. They are under assault uh, from sinister and diabolic enemies abroad who are everywhere abroad. And they are on, under assault by a kind of fifth column of, of uh, subversive uh, elements within society. And so they are under a general assault from abroad and from within. And the purpose of this assault is to annihilate the people of God. So, and one of the ways in which the assault has taken place from the people within is by undermining the morals and principles of the people of God. So the people of God are under a kind of military threat, and they are under a moral threat. Their principles are being undermined, and their, 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 their power is being threatened. And the danger is total. So. The people of God must mobilize themselves and must throw themselves into a sacred war, which in the, in the uh, book of the Apocalypse will last, uh, the book of St. John, uh, um, uh, will, will, will last one hour. And the, after, in this war, there will be terrible sufferings in the extreme. But at the end, the people of God, after the one hour and the terrible sufferings, the people of God will triumph, and the rule of God will be reestablished, and it will last 1,000 years. So it will be the millennium. Now, this is the old biblical idea. In the 
the 20th century, this became a political ideology, or rather a series of political ideologies. <coughs> you could first be, begin to see it cropping up among poets in the late 19th century. And you could find traces of this in Rimbaud and other writers. But in the early 20th century, it became a, a series of political ideologies, and it became fantastically adaptable. That through a system of vocabulary substitution, mm -hmm. you can turn this ideology in any direction you, you like. So, in the first version, the people of God are the Russian proletariat. They are under assault from within by sinister agents who might be Trotskyite agents of, of imperialism, or might be kulaks who are attempting to become wealthy farmers, or are other agents of the bourgeoisie. And these people must be exterminated. And the, the proletariat is under assault from forces abroad, who are the forces of capitalism and imperialism. And those people must be fended off. And the struggle which is going to destroy these internal agents and the external forces of imperialism and capitalism is the class war. And this was Stalinism. Leninism first and then Stalinism. Then there was a German version. The people of God are the Aryan race. They are under assault from within by Jews and other people of that sort. They are under assault from without by, on the East, the, the, uh, the Soviet Union and the communists, and, and to the West, the British Empire and the imperialists, and ultimately uh, the United States. And the forces within must be exterminated, and the forces without must be fended off in a terrible war. And this will be the race war. In the communist version, the, alt, the goal is going to be communism, which will be the end of history, which will be the final stage of history. It will last forever, a thousand years, so to speak. In the Nazi version, which I've just described, the ultimate goal will be the Third Reich, which will be the resurrection of the ancient Roman Empire. And it will likewise rule be a thousand year Reich. So the reference is direct. Mussolini has a kind of version of this. Franco has a kind of version of this. And, and so on. Said Kutub and other uh, writers, uh, the original one was uh, a figure named Hassan Albana, who was uh, uh, not hanged in 1966, but in his case shot in 1949, <laughs> by, also by the Egyptian government. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that their version was Islamic. This ideology arose in the 1930s and 40s in Egypt, and then was developed by Kutub in the 1950s and 60s, and, and, and went like this. There is a people of God. It is the Muslim community. The Muslim community has come under terrible assault from within. These are the Muslim hypocrites who, who do not adhere to the, to the true religion, who are undermining it. And it is the, these are the Jews and, and other forces within Muslim society. And the Muslim community has come, from, come under assault from without by the Western imperialists, by the British and the French, and then the Americans. And of course, the Zionists are, are a especially sinister group. I should re mention, I guess, that in, in, in the biblical uh, book of the Apocalypse, uh, there's a reference to the synagogue of Satan. So uh, this notion of, of Jewish evil, uh, which is shared by every one of these ideologies uh, in different ways, is, is, is there from the start. Uh, in, the, in the Muslim version, we must reconstitute the Muslim community, which is to say we, we must reform the original Islamic empire that was founded by the Prophet Muhammad himself and his companions in the 7th century. We must uh, return to that. 
and we must wage a war against the internal enemies and the external enemies and the name of this war will be the jihad and and the jihad will be terribly bloody but at the end will be reestablished the uh, the islamic empire of yore i should say that each of these ideologies uh has the notion of reestablishing uh, the ancient empire for the the Nazis, the Third Reich is going to, Reich means uh, empire, and it's the Third Empire because the Second Empire was the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages, and the original empire was the Roman Empire. So it's your dentist in a way, it's a reconstitution, it's a reconstitutioning phenomenon, bringing back, reuniting. Yes, we're going to return to the ancient, what uh, existed in ancient times. Mussolini has this version, which is also the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, Franco has a version which is medieval Spain. Uh, 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 Lenin doesn't exactly have this version, but Stalin definitely does, which is that we're returning to the ancient uh, uh, communal life of the Russian folk uh, before uh, uh, Russian society got destroyed by capitalism. And, and, and then the Muslim version is, is classic. We're going to re restore the empire that was founded by the prophet uh, Muhammad himself. Can I ask a question? Just an in, 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 incredibly interesting uh, kind of, uh, but just one little question about: it. Do, do you believe that the the ideology precedes the revolutionary fervor, or that it becomes the they always say the intellectuals, the ideologists, the revolution? Uh, going back to Dan's, you know, Dan put us back in 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 the, in the town where he regarded the beginning of the Bosnian the Bosnian conflict to begin in the, the Vukovar. Uh, a moment in history, but are, there, there are you have you have an intellectual working and in creating a creating a, a, a vision of history, and then you have historical forces that are going on inside of people. Are the traumas that 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 exist, say, in Yugoslavian society? Then I mean, at what point does the ideal, ideal you know, it's like post hoc ergo proctor hoc, proper hoc. What what comes first? You know, does the does the ideology come, or does do the conditions come that make it? make it a, a, a fertile growing ground for the ideology to latch on, you know, virally. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer with a little uh, literary history. That, that the, the, the ideology begins, as I mentioned in passing, uh, as, as, as poetry in the 19th century. And it's a kind of ro post-romantic poetry. The, the romantic poets in the early 19th century uh, Oh, I have some uh, 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 beautiful ideas, but they're kind of, uh, 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 but they're relatively simple. But then, beginning in the in the late 19th century, the symbolist poets, Rimbaud, uh, Ruben Dario in in uh, Latin America, uh, you can find some of the same uh, same ideas in Yeats, um, uh, in English. So, in one language uh, a, 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 after another, you you can find you can find these ideas. Begin to write fantastic poems about apocalyptic struggles oh. and 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 the poems are are and the poems are great and uh Saeed so have wrote some of these poems himself by the way in 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 arabic which i read in english translation and i would say that the whole set of ideas that i've outlined are are gripping ideas, and they speak to deep things in the soul, which we could we, we could speak about. And they, they have a certain beauty, and and it's and it's fine to have these ideas. And the proper place for them is poetry. <laughs> and, and, and 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 although Plato and, thought poets were the dangerous the dangerous people in the well, I think the there's a place for poets and. And uh, you know, other you know, mad and destructive ideas have other places, which is uh, you know, rock bands, and <laughs> and and, and uh, so so these ideas be, uh, begin with poetry. Then, uh, beginning in Italy, really, 1910, uh, Martin Eddy, a variety of thinkers begin to turn these these doctrines into into political ideas. At first. There's not much possibility that they're going to get very far. But then, this is my historical answer to your question, then a series of terrible things begin to happen. And the first of those terrible things, and, and, and the worst, from which we've never recovered still, was World War I. Yeah. And, 
and because until World War I, you could, you, 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 could, you could really believe, serious people all over the world could believe that world history is moving in a, in a progressive direction, things are getting better, uh, we've, we've, uh, we have avoided uh, 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 really horrendous wars of, of various sorts. Uh, we have discovered the secret of how to generate wealth, which, which is through uh, modern production and world trade. Uh, we've discovered some principles of civility, which is that countries will get along. They won't necessarily all have the same political system. They won't necessarily all be democratic, but, but, but they will all be kind of rational. And, 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 and they will be based uh, on, on principles of, of um, uh, diplomatic reasonableness and world trade. And, and on this basis, there was an idea all over the world that the secret of, world, uh, of human progress had been found, and we're, we're going in this direction. And it's true, uh, 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 Western Europe and North America were the, were the places where, where the signs of this progress were most visible. But you could believe in this idea everywhere. Uh, around the world, even if your own society was at the moment doing rather, doing rather poorly. Now already, uh, uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, there were places around the world where, where, where you could say, uh, this, is, this is nonsense, that in fact powerful irrational forces are, are, are at work. And, uh, 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 the Belgians were exterminating masses of, of Congolese and uh, uh, things, like, things like that. Uh, and a whole tribe in uh, uh, Southwest Africa was exterminated by the Germans in the beginning of uh, the 20th century. So there were signs around the world that, that, that things were not quite so reasonable. But still, you could believe that on balance, uh, the world was headed in that direction. Then came World War one, which began in exactly this, this uh, uh, slightly damned region of the, of, of, of the world, uh, in, in, in the Balkans. And the irra irrationality of it, of it was so shocking. And the degree of, of suffering was so shocking. 11 million people were killed. And for what? What were the causes of World War I? We, we, we still don't know. Can I intervene here? Because we still have one member of the panel we haven't I'm sorry. heard from. Uh, Isra Wallach is on. Why don't you just finish your thought and then? Well, you need to. It's. Complain. No, I'd like to to okay. hear your Okay. Well, view. all right. I, I'm I'm uh, tempted to jump in with both feet uh, <laughs> uh, for the uh, sort of meta narrative that you've set up. But I, I think I, I'd probably do better to to stick to my uh, original uh, uh, game plan here, which was to go. To go back, first of all, to square one, which is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the ostensible uh, topic of this uh, of this panel, and when I was invited to uh, participate in it, I wasn't quite sure what, if at all, my place could could be here. Uh, it, it presented itself to me as it's as it's written on the. the the sheet that everyone has as a as a kind of uh, intellectual Rorschach test. I mean, there were three categories that were jostling around here, and I must say I, I did have trouble sorting them out. I mean, uh, the first category was extremism. That that was sort of the umbrella category yeah. here. All right, extremism, bad. The, the, the but the second category, the the second category was social cohesion. To my mind. Good. <laughs> Identity, always very elusive, unstable, and I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. All right. Now, I concluded that I'd best decline the, the invitation to participate. <laughs> uh, and I explained briefly uh, what, what my main thought was, that uh, to me, social cohesion was a positive uh, value. And for me, it evoked, um, in particular, the, the progressive notion uh, in the modern era uh, of solidarity, uh, at least in the, in the, in the modern uh, Western democracies as one of the, uh, one of the con primary contending values, so to speak. So I, I thought that uh, basically this, this really was, from my point of view, was not going to work, this melding of uh, extremism and, and social cohesion. <laughs> Mr. Levy responded that uh, that this contrarian note might actually be productive and uh, 
Uh, it may be tangential. Uh, perhaps <laughs> it will end up being totally irrelevant here. I, I, I don't know, but that, uh, that it might uh, contribute something to this. So, so here I am. Now, uh, I needed a, a, an entry point into, in, in, into this uh, uh, tangled uh, uh, nexus. And uh, I, I thought I would start with a very, very brief uh, uh, reference to the traditional model of cohesion uh, in uh, uh, in the Western uh, in the Western world, which was the medieval idea. Now, Paul Berman has given perhaps a good argument for just sort of skipping over this and throwing ourselves into the 20th century, uh, and that actually may be that may be sound, but uh, possibly not. In any case. Social cohesion in the West uh, in, under the under the medieval ideal, about which, by the way, Dick Bullitt knows more more than I do. But I don't think I'm doing violence to say that first. First of all, it was it was the the idea uh, of uh, of four functional uh, estates: uh, those who prayed, those who fought, uh, those who tilled the soil, those who traded. Uh, the, the burghers. Uh, the second principle was that this was essentially hereditary. Uh, not entirely, but basically these were hereditary uh, st statuses. That, uh, thirdly, that they, they involved recipro reciprocal obligations uh, um, among them. Uh, and that finally the fealty to a prince uh, would sort of uh, sit atop this and help give it uh, a further degree of coherence. But this, this was an, you know, an eminently uh, a cohesive uh, uh, set of practices. Uh, you could call it an ideology if you want to, or a, a, a theory, uh, what, whatever you wish. Now, he, he, here's, here's the real point. A axiomatically, uh, the great turning point of the French Revolution uh, has to replace this model of, uh, of cohesion and identity, uh, which was based on uh, hereditary estates, the king's integrating role, things like that. Uh, so uh, it proclaims the sovereignty of the, of the people, uh, and also it essentially liberates 25 million individuals. You now have 25 million free and to a certain extent equal individuals uh, in France as of, as of 1789. What is going to hold them together? What is going to provide social cohesion? So th that's really my starting point for this, uh, for, for this discussion. Uh, the French Revolution uh, had an answer for this. Uh, the answer was positive law, uh, law that would be uh, crafted by a reformed, uh, legitimate state. The state would emanate, uh, in turn, from the, the, the newly sovereign people. Uh, this act of alchemy would occur through, through, through the, uh, the vehicle of representation, representative government, uh, and that, in turn, would be enabled by the mechanism of elections. So that, that basically is the French revolutionary uh, answer to how to create, how to recreate social cohesion in a society that's been totally atomized into free individuals, but that has to be, in effect, re-cemented. And the cement would be legitimate law. Um, as a matter of fact, if I was shifting over to, to ask a, a question uh, of this larger uh, uh, overarching narrative that you gave, I, I, I would ask you about the question of law, where, where that f fits in, and so forth. But, but for the moment, let me let, let, let me move let, let me move on. Um, the, the the problem immediately though arises in the French Revolution that it's a, it's a, it's an unstable solution, uh, particularly uh, who speaks for the people. Uh, the, the doctrine of the French revolutionaries was that only the representatives of the people can, in fact, speak for the people, the, du the duly elected representatives. But as everyone knows, uh, this proved a very unstable uh, idea. Uh, the voice of the people uh, is, is being expressed uh, in, in, in ever so many new ways and in new registers uh, and with new uh, thrusts uh, behind it almost uh, immediately. Uh, New, new outlets for public opinion, new, uh, new, new forms of political activism, violent, nonviolent, and so forth. All of this outside the, the, the channels that the revolutionaries were trying to, uh, to establish for re-cementing uh, their society. 
Uh, nonetheless, the founding fathers of the, of the French Revolution proceed uh, with their various uh, projects, use the power that they have in the first instance to try to re-knit uh, the foundations for social cohesion uh, in, the, in their society. And, uh, you know, their, their sort of world historic uh, uh, slogan uh, is, is what embodies that hope. Uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. Well, again, everyone knows equality and liberty are in tension right from the beginning and, and, and ever after. I, I would add to that, though, that fraternity, I think, t tilts the balance towards equality. And I think that's the, uh, basically one of the outcomes of the French Revolution. It is tilted towards the notion of what we would eventually call in the 20th century solidarity, social, social solidarity. Uh, but of course, within the French Revolution itself, uh, fault lines immediately appear, right? And uh, uh, very quickly, if inclusion and solidarity is, is one motif, uh, then exclusion becomes uh, another, uh, particularly around a great moral fissure that opens uh, uh, in society, and that is uh, uh, the, the notion that the, the body politic uh, uh, is uh, threatened by uh, evil people, aristocrats, egoists, various terms are used to describe them, who are, in effect, undermining the future of a good, a basically good, virtuous uh, people. That's really, at bottom, what the, the big fault line is in the French Revolution. It has related religious uh, aspects, uh, the Catholic uh, a good part of Catholicism in France feels eventually that it's under siege, and that reinforces uh, the other fish you, but but the the point is that the French Revolution bequeaths to us then uh, sort of two two legacies. One is of uh, this kind of conflict, uh, and the other, but the other, and I think the major the major motif is uh, is the notion of of uh, of social solidarity as being the basis of a. Uh, of a modern society. But weren't there some millenarian notions similar to what Paul was talking about in, 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 in the renaming of the months of the year and the recreation of the world? And this uh, kind of I, I wouldn't call it millenarian. I would call it uh, extremely uh, optimistic and so, uh, somewhat naive about being able to start over again, so to speak. Well, you're an enlightenment And to try to, 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 you know, to symbolize that notion of a new start by by all that, and also simply getting rid of objectionable things. I mean, look, the new names replaced old names that had come into disrepute, into bad odor. So you're, you're replacing them. When, when, you, when you carry it over to things like the months and the days and the calendar, that's, uh, that becomes... Uh, but, you know, but when, you, um, when you look at liberty, equality, fraternity, and you, uh, and you say that that's, that's the, the, the bedrock that you get out of the French Revolution, and then picking up Paul's thing that, you know, prior to World War I, uh, the world appeared to be moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. From a, I, I'm not a post-colonial yeah. thinker or writer in, by any means, but you have people nowadays who say that that view that the world is going in the right direction that was prevalent prior to World War I is precisely an example of the meta narrative you're talking about in that uh, Europeans and Americans thought they were the future That's and that they would, uh, they knew how things were supposed to go. Yeah. They had it fixed. They were God's chosen. And that was often expressed in an explicitly racialist fashion, in which you said it is white people, particularly from Northern Europe, and their cousins in America that were God's chosen people and other people, whether they were the lesser Europeans or even more if they were in the colonies, they were the internal and the external enemies that uh, had to be suppressed. This carries over into modernization theory after World War II when religion was supposed to be driven out of the public arena. Uh, and that comes to be seen as the great enemy by, uh, not just by Muslims, but by other groups around the world. And, you know, it's, it's not clear to me that what you're presenting as, uh, as the golden moment before World War I cannot equally be represented as a moment of, of some of the 
most profound ideological oppression in, in world history. So it's the nadir, in other words. Yeah, and, and it's the, it's the question of, of this meta narrative is uh, is a very complex one, particularly. And, and here I just want to, to to make a particular note: is that you're rooting this in the revolution, revelation of Saint John the Divine, which is a Christian text, which Muslims never refer to. Uh, or extremely rarely refer to it. They have their own eschatology, which is not the same as the, uh, as the Christian uh, eschatology. And they do not, in their eschatology, visualize uh, the reconstruction of the, uh, uh, of the empire of Muhammad. They visualize the coming of a messiah <coughs> and who comes after a great demon, an antichrist, is fought against in this terrible bloodbath. And he is killed. And you know who kills the, who kills the Antichrist in Islamic meta, uh, eschatology? Is Jesus. Uh, the Muslims, both Sunnis and Shiites, believe that in the end of time, you have the great monster, the great demon of the apocalypse who comes. It's called the Dajjal. And he is fought against and killed by Jesus Christ, who comes back. And then, you have the Muslim Mahdi, or Messiah, who comes and presides over the millennium. Now, if you, if you took that instead of the Revelation of St. John as your paradigm, I mean, one of the problems with your paradigm is that you never talked about the Christians. You talked about you know, the Nazis and the, the, the Stalinists and the Muslims. But this is a country where um, uh, left behind, has, and has sold 20 million copies, and we have a tremendous uh, segment of our population that are subscribing to a Christian version of this. Now, I, I'm going to drop this here and um, move on. Uh, Dan, do you want to come back in? Or Paul, who, who wants to pick up something? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I have You've a left very, us all uh, behind. Yeah. I, I mean, I suppose my interest in this is very kind of... Uh, Simplistic. I, 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 I want to know how, when you when you deal with these concepts of, you know, identity, social cohesion, uh, ideology, belief, fanaticism, extremism. At the end of the day, what can we do to prevent a dirty bomb from going off in Times Square? How? And that was my experience in Yugoslavia. Is why. What are the forces that have led these people to think it's okay or a greater good to put themselves in harm's way? Where it was obvious that when you began to pull, you know, kind of the figures out of the dike, that a lot of people were going to die and a lot of people were going to suffer. Mm. I got into an argument with the defense minister and the. Uh, I guess for lack of a better word, Secretary of State of the new nation of Slovenia, the night they declared independence. And I, I'm sure they thought I was a lunatic, but my concern was everyone said that if they left, if you pulled the plug, people were going to die. And now there was only a very brief war in Slovenia, but then the balance was upset. So. Uh, and then it led to the war in, in the, the Muslims or, or the, the Bosnians, or they were technically, uh, they were an official minority under Tito. They were Muslims. Um, they didn't want to stay in the, the rump Yugoslavia. And the Serbs said, if you go out, there will be war. Because there will be war. This is very simple. There's going to be a war. You have a choice. You can choose peace. We can divide up the country. I spent two hours one day with Radovan Karadzic, where he explained to me, great, calm detail, we'll make it like Switzerland, we'll divide up the country. What's wrong with it? Why isn't that a solution? The Americans and the, the Muslims didn't want that. So here we are today. How do we, and I'm interested in getting back to, to, to Paul's paradigm, where does that lead us? How do we deal with these forces, these intellectual forces that have created this extremism, which could ruin our day, basically? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. And, and, and I think 
and I have a preposterously simple answer to it, which is uh, I think that, that in an extremely modest way, we are doing that right here. And, and I think that the ultimate aim has to be uh, to show what are these doctrines, to, to, to kind of take them apart, to show how they work, to, to, to show where the gears are, where the screws are, what, what are the doctrines. So the people who adhere to a variety of, of extremist doctrines will be able to see that, that their, their beliefs are not reality, are not truth, but, but are, instead, are instead mere ideologies, and that, and that their, their, their ideological beliefs are in fact a series of old cliches, and, and, and that they should step back and, and see, be able to see that they have fallen into, a, into, a, into a, a simple error, which is to imagine that their, their, their doctrinal view of the world is reality. Once they've been able to step back from that, people, they will be able to change their ideas. One of the amazing things of the, somebody is nodding no, and, and one of the amazing facts of, of, of the last 60 or 70 years is, is that we've seen uh, a couple of instances of masses of people abandoning their ideas in favor of better ideas. The military victory over Germany in World War II uh, would not have accomplished a lot if, if millions and millions of Germans had remained ardent Nazis as they had been. And uh, we would still be fighting in Germany as we are fighting in uh, other countries right now where people have not abandoned their old, old ideas. Uh, the fall of communism is one of the most uh, amazing and beautiful th things in all of world history. Which is, which is that millions of, of, of communists uh, uh, eventually looked up and suddenly said, you know, you're right. We're wrong. Communism is a mistake. Now, you're reporting from a part of the world where that led to disaster, but, but, but in vast parts of the world, uh, that led to, well, mixed results, but I think on balance, uh, uh, progressive ones. And, and, and in quite a few countries, really visibly progressive ones. It is like Lobby, we had Tito as a Frederick II almost. I know, and, and I mean, I myself uh, uh, had a, used to harbor a kind of veiled admiration for Tito because I thought, well, it wasn't that Tito was so great, but that under, under Yugoslav communism there were some very interesting people, and it was, it was quite easy to imagine Yugoslav communism evolving into a, a sort of creative and indeed superior social democracy and 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 there were some marvelous intellectuals yeah. uh, uh, like Mihailo Markovic who was a hero of mine for, for a little while until, until he turned into a crazed Serb nationalist <laughs> uh, and 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 and, uh, and which ought to you know instill a little humility on my part and 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 uh, and it seemed possible so um, but still, my answer is 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 that uh, my answer to the practical question is, is is to say that discussions like this are themselves helpful. That we that we try to 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 uh, demystify these doctrines, and, and so that people will be able to recognize them as doctrines, uh, uh, look at them and uh, uh, abandon them or revise them uh, so dramatically as, as, as to become uh, something else. Some of the communist parties of, of Europe have become social democratic parties. That's great. Uh, some of the old basically fascist parties have become uh, Christian democratic parties. That's great. And, 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 and it's perfectly possible uh, for people to, to change their ideas. The worst fanatics, no. But, 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 but the masses of reasonable people who, who, who uh, find themselves just naturally enlisted in in, in, in these movements, yes, they can. Talk to the head of the, to the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt today. They disown Sayyid Qutb. Yes, so the, they, they say he, he he was a member, but we don't follow yes. his doctrine. So yes, yes, they 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 have turned against Qutb. Uh, I, I could go on about that. Uh, you know, the, yeah, so some of the anti Qutbites <laughs> aren't so wonderful either. But 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 yes, yeah. they 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 uh, turn against Qutb. Now, if I can respond to some of these other uh, comments, I think uh, the point about the Middle Ages and the French Revolution is 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 uh, absolutely on uh, on the mark, and 
and that to describe the world situation uh, in, in uh, preposterously broad terms, uh, I, I would say that, that everybody on earth has been facing these problems that, which were, which were uh, posed so clearly by, by the French Revolution, which is to say everywhere on earth there used to be a, a society of social cohesion in the, in the medieval uh, version of it that, that, that we've heard described, where everybody has his place uh, in, in, in society and uh, in, uh, based on principles of uh, mutual obligation and this kind of thing. And everywhere on earth, this sort of society has been disrupted. And it was disrupted originally not by, by uh, a revolutionary movement, says in France, I think was d uh, d disrupted originally by the development of some co new kinds of, of market and economic systems, and uh, so it was disrupted in, in, in a variety of ways, and, and then there were responses to it, and the French, the French Revolution is a radical moment where people say, we're going to get rid of that old system altogether, and we're going to re replace it, you know, tomorrow or today with an, with an, with an entirely new system. And, uh, and they did, uh, with some mixed success, but they, but they did replace the old system. Now, I think that in the course of the 19th century, uh, that uh, this led to mixed results on, on, on a world scale. And it's absolutely the case that, that imperialist uh, rapacity on the part of the of, um, of the Western Europeans and Northern Europeans uh, uh, especially became obviously a, a, a vast thing. And it had been a vast thing for a couple of hundred years. And in the 19th century, it, uh, uh, it, it re reached an apex in some ways, although in other ways it was also beginning to reform itself. The abolition of the slave trade and uh, 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 things like that uh, had gotten underway. So there were mixed things going on uh, from, from the point of view of if we look at imperialism in, in, in the 19th century. And, uh, uh, but, but one thing nonetheless was true, that at least in, in parts of the world, uh, in, in parts of Europe, large parts of Europe, and in North America, and in a few other areas around the world, in parts of South America, and a few other areas around the world, something new had happened. And, and, and this something new was that large societies were showing that it was possible to in increase wealth, absolutely. And, and, and it was possible to increase wealth by an increase of productivity. That the only way to become rich was no longer to steal somebody else's wealth. That you could actually increase productivity. And so for the first time, it became possible to imagine that that the human race might be lifted, that the, the entire human race might be lifted above poverty. And, and, and it became possible to imagine that the entire human race, not just the privileged white Northern European or North American uh, societies, but the entire human race might be lifted into, in, onto the plane of Onto the, onto the plane of a, of a fully human existence, of, of, of wealth, of, of, of a life expectancy that, that would be more than you know, 30 years, uh, and, 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 and a society uh, based on, on uh, uh, rationality, uh, rationalism, and, and this sort of thing. So these ideas became possible to imagine, even though it is also true that in, uh, in various parts of the world, uh, the worst kinds of atrocities uh, were going on. So my point is that because it became possible uh, to imagine this in, in, in the 19th century, well, I should say that people began to imagine this in the 19th century, and they began to imagine it all over the world, so that, that all over the world, even in the societies that were victims of, of the imperialist developments in, in the Western countries, people began to imagine that although we are victims now, it should be possible that we too will benefit from these developments. And of course, we, we will benefit by becoming independent, throwing off these, these horrible imperialists, but then when we do, we ought to be able to uh, develop in this way. Now, this led, I think, to a, an immediate contradiction, which was 
or, or difficulty, which was that these new developments willy-nilly broke up the old social cohesion of the Middle Ages. And although people spoke about solidarity uh, coming out of the French Revolution, and there were all kinds of movements for social solidarity within this new society that began to arise in, in the 19th century. These were limited kinds of solidarity. These were solidar new kinds of solidarity that were proposed that were going to be appropriate for the new kind of society, which is one that had broken up those old medieval uh, systems of, of co cohesion. There was still right. going to be a society of free individuals, but it was going to be free individuals with a trade union movement or free individuals right. with uh, other forms of, of solidarity to prevent the excesses of, of, of a complete smash-up of, of social cohesion. So you had these ideas... Just those, the, those forms of solidarity also included uh, precisely the, the National Socialists of Germany and the, in the, the Stalinists and so in, forth. In, the, the, those, those forms of, of... Those things arose, as I say, in the aftermath of World, uh, War, World, II, World War I. Well, I because see, it was World War I that, that broke up this, this simple optimism that I'm discussing for the 19th century. And can, now... Can I, can I let Esser back into the conversation here? He's been... Yeah. Well, uh, the, I wanted to, to, to take up a point you were just you were making, but then... Got, got yeah. Little, um, <laughs> okay, the, the, this... The, the, here, here would be my, my uh, entree point into this. Uh, a society has to put its, it, its house in order, basically. It needs to have a, a reasonable degree of social cohesion and solidarity. I mean, if, if you raise an apocalyptic scenario of, uh, of the kind you did, uh, if it's going to come from, I don't know, Pakistan, Egypt, wherever, these are societies that have not managed to put their own internal houses in order. Uh, they don't have social cohesion and they're prey to all sorts of uh, the ex ex extremist uh, uh, ideologies. In Egypt they do a good job of keeping the lid on it, I suppose. In Pakistan maybe less so, but it's, it's, saying a, uh, it's a dictatorship is doing a good job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a little uncomfortable. Let, let's, let's keep shifting back, though, to, to the West. I mean, what does the West uh, what does the West offer us? What does it teach us? Uh, what can we learn for it, from it? Look, uh, first of all, I, I, I would say I, I don't. I have yet to to, uh, to fall prey to an apocalyptic frame of mind about where we are today in relation to the to to, 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 to these to these threats that uh, that that we've been talking about. I think living in 1938, 39 would have been far more frightening insofar as I can ever mentally uh, put myself back into, in, in, mm. into that situation, or, you know, along the lines that you, you, you sketched out for us here. Uh, but uh, what, what I would like to uh, uh, take note of is, a, is something very uh, interesting to my mind, which was that when Roosevelt finally uh, began to move towards, uh, towards engagement uh, with the, with the uh, with the, uh, particularly the European situation. Uh, he was obviously very late in, in, in doing this, but uh, by late 1940, 1941, he, he, he was moving towards yeah. full engagement. All, all aid to Britain uh, short of war was, was the sort of uh, holding uh, pattern for him until, until we finally uh, went in. But, but we were gearing up for war. We, we were rearming. And he was uh, beginning to, uh, both in his own mind and then in, in public, to articulate what, what, what we and the world were, were up against. And, and what, this is what I find ex extremely interesting. He said on numerous occasions at that point that the thing that made it possible for America to stand up to the dictators, Hitler most obviously, uh, possibly Stalin, Mussolini at a given moment, but primarily Hitler, was the fact that we had put our own house in order. In other words, we had had the New Deal, and that had made America a society yeah. that could both be uh, an example to the rest of the world and would have the 
the internal cohesion to undertake this, this struggle if we had to. And then very interestingly, when he had to then formulate this into a kind of soundbite, uh, which he did with the notion of the four freedoms, it's very interesting to, you know, to, to, uh, to parse that. Uh, two of the freedoms in the four freedoms were individual, classic individual liberties, freedom of religion, free, freedom of thought. A third of the four freedoms was freedom from fear, which was very circumstantial. I mean, that's what the, the world was was facing at that point in time because of the uh, the totalitarian uh, uh, dictatorships and the mili- and the military uh, uh, potential of that. So f- freedom from fear. And but the fourth freedom was freedom from want, which was, to my mind, a shorthand for the whole. Uh, nexus of, of the New Deal, social solidarity, uh, trade unionism, uh, uh, social security, uh, work relief, the whole, the, whole, the whole complex of things that had actually finally uh, been achieved by the New Deal. And it, it, I mean, in, in Roosevelt's mind, this was what uh, uh, made America a, a potential and worthy uh, uh, antagonist yeah. to that. So the first lesson is you, you have to put your own house in order and you have to cultivate a degree of social cohesion based on social solidarity. Okay. I, um, you know, the, the, to me, there's a very odd thing that we mustered that, that will to, to defeat uh, the totalitarian uh, rulers of Europe. And then after the war, we supported totalitarian dictators uh, elsewhere in the world. And there's an inconsistency there, whether it's in, uh, in Egypt or uh, South America or something. Absolutely. And I, I think that the celebratory story of the great struggle against uh, Stalinism and Hitlerism is not, doesn't read as well now as it did in another point. However. We're also at a point where we're going to open the discussion to questions and comments uh, from the audience. So come up to the mic and let us know who you are, and then and that's where the camera can pick you up, too. So I think we have one right over there. Come on over. We're going to do this for about half an hour, half an hour so do yeah. not make long speeches the way right. we do. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm new to New York, and this is the second time that I've come here. My name is Dr. Nancy Cobrin. I'm a psychoanalyst, an Arabist, and a counterterrorist consultant, and I just published The Banality of Suicide Terrorism. And I went to the um, uh, uh, roundtable on social networking because of um, jihadi recruitment on the Internet, and it was just fantastic. Um, And I want to say that I uh, agree with you, Paul. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meet you. But that it's education, education, education. And um, I have a couple of uh, two points to make and then uh, a question to ask the roundtable. Professor Bullitt, you made um, an interesting comment about Dajjal, the Antichrist. Um, Dajjal, however, in Islam is associated with the Jew. So I, as a Jewish woman, this doesn't make me feel too good that I'm this object of hate. And um, the other thing about the LLTE, the Tamil Tigers, I lectured to um, Sri Lankan military. I went into rebel territory. And we forget that the Tamil, we, we frame them as a secular nationalist uh, liberation movement, but we forget that the children are essentially raised in Hinduism and that early childhood development is key to understanding extremism. As a psychoanalyst wearing my psychoanalytic hat, I would say the personality is almost set in cement by the end of the first year of life, and nobody wants to go there. And my interest in extremism particularly is the nonverbal symbolic communication of the terrorists, of the extremists, because they are effective in communicating to us through their predatory behavior, and we are more alike than we are different. We are human beings. Having studied, I'm embarrassed to say this, 12 languages, um, I came to this understanding rather late in life. Now, 
I was wondering if the round table knew about the Center for Social Cohesion, I tend to be a little concrete in my thinking, um, in Britain. Uh, because the Brits came to the conclusion that people were not integrating and they set up um, a, a actual center, it's funded. I don't know the uh, relationship so well with the government, et cetera, but I wanted to ask you what the panel, what you might think of um, in some of the documents that are posted online, they did geomapping about where they found um, jihadis in what neighborhoods and they did geomapping of where they found this is so terrible honor killing in what neighborhoods and lo and behold they were in the same neighborhoods and sort of um, it's unfortunate that Professor Hebeck is in here she does such wonderful work too but I was wondering if we if perhaps you might have something to say about uh, the female in these, cult in, in these cultures and extremism. So thanks also for introducing the ontogenic element here, because I mean, when Dan, it was very moving when you were talking it before, and I think we didn't sort of take up on it. Uh, we, were, we wanted to have a trauma person here, and they couldn't make it today. But to sort of deal with the fact of why, why would one, you said, why would they, they, they were on the verge of such self-destructive behavior. From looking at things on an ontogenic basis, in terms of individual psychology, it's very understandable. People do that kind of thing all the time. Why not countries? <laughs> yeah, I would also add that part of, I mean, you're t we're talking about shame honor cultures that yeah. are spawning the extremism, and by definition, they're collective cultures. They're not, they're not Western in the sense of valuing the individual, and in these cultures, they're not permitted to separate from their mothers, and this is going to cause, a in my point of view, a kind of impairment in seeing the world more clearly, more uh, independently. And if you are um, not able to have a psychological in infrastructure, it's going to be reflected in the communal uh, lack of it in the civic in infrastructure. And that's why it falls apart. Like when we exit Iraq or Afghanistan, it's going to fall apart again. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think it's very unlikely that exiting Iraq is going to cause it to fall apart, but you know, time will tell. Um, <coughs> stories about the end of the world, of course, vary uh, enormously. There was, during Muhammad's lifetime, there was a young man who was not Jewish who was said to be the Dajjal because there were people who believed that when Muhammad died, the end of the world would follow immediately because he was the last of the of the messengers of God, and therefore, once he was dead, um, that you know, roll the credits. I mean, at the, the end of the, the the end of of the show. And and in fact, when since one of the attributes of a messenger of God is that he rides on a donkey, uh, when Muhammad died, his donkey, who was the son of the donkey of Jesus, who was the son of the donkey of Moses, who was the son of the donkey. There's only one donkey, <laughs> and. Uh, but the donkey, when he heard that Muhammad was dead, he ran to a well and dove in head first to drown himself, because then there could never be another messenger of God if the sacred donkey yeah, so was dead. But the, but the point is that this, this man came to uh, Muhammad, went to the man and said, are you the Antichrist? Are you the beast of the apocalypse? Because uh, people say you are. And he said, uh, no, I'm not. And that was the end of the story. It was <laughs> a bit of, uh, uh, but, but the point is that these apocalyptic tales are, are highly malleable. Some, some of them are very anti-Jewish. Uh, others are, are, are not. It, but, um, but the question of the, uh, the ontogenesis of fanaticism and the infant mind, I haven't a clue. So I'll leave it to somebody else to... You want to go to that? Uh, well, I, I like to uh, jump in just to... Uh, use the occasion to respond to one thing I, I hadn't said before and, and, and respond to this uh, comment just uh, just now uh, with the observation that there are three different categories of uh, that we could um, uh, keep in mind. These are the psychological, the cultural, and the, uh, and the ideological. Mm. And, and I think it's important to, to keep those three categories uh, distinct. 
or, or at least to be aware of, of distinctions uh, between the three. On the psychological aspect, I have uh, nothing to contribute uh, um, because of the psychological defects of my own. And, 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 and on, the, on, the, on the cultural uh, uh, question, well, this is my uh, great point here, to try and draw a distinction between what is cultural and what is ideological. If we're dealing with cultural questions, it's very hard to speak about changing them because cultural questions are, 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 are cultural uh, uh, traits or traits that have arisen over the course of thousands of years and you're not going to change them between today and tomorrow. Uh, but ideological questions are different because ideologies do arise. You can talk about a specific origin, you can say such, you know, the Marxism was created, we know who created Marxism. It was a man named Karl. <laughs> and, 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 and so it's, it's, it's possible to, to, to ident give it a specific um, uh, definition and then argue, uh, argue with it, uh, decide what's good and bad about it, and, and talk people out of the uh, bad aspects of it. So that's on the, on the ideological uh, plane. So that's been my emphasis. And now let me add a, a, a factoidal detail uh, on, 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 on the question of uh, side Qutb and the uh, ideology that I call Islamism. I draw a distinction in uh, all my writings uh, on, the, on the current situations uh, that we face between Islam, the ancient religion, which is 1,400 years old, and the modern doctrine that I call and many people call Islamism, which, is a, which I think is a specific uh, political and religious doctrine that arose in the 20th century. And it has a founder. And, and, and that, found, uh, that founder is Hassan al-Banna, who, who, who founded the, the Muslim Brotherhood. He drew on thinkers before him going back into the 19th century, but he essentially founded this doctrine. Syed Qutb came up with a, uh, a version of it which had been massively uh, diffused. In this doctrine, as I read it, uh, there is in fact an influence that ultimately could be traced back to Christianity. And that this doctrine, Islamism, which is the doctrine of the Muslim Brotherhood in its wildly radical uh, uh, strands and also its not so radical strands, uh, and, and a variety of movements that have been inspired by the Muslim Brotherhood, this, this doctrine claims to be the authentic, true represent representative of the real Islam. But I think it is in fact a doctrine. And uh, some people could say it is the real Islam, and many people I, uh, say, and I think uh, with a degree of persuasiveness, that it is not, it, it, it is a modern doctrine that has, has, has uh, in some ways, falsely claimed to stand for the old Islam. And this modern doctrine, I think, has been, been inspired by the European totalitarianisms of the of the mid-20th century. So that when Hassan al-Banna and Said Qutb and other writers, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, Ali Shariati, and others in, in, in um, uh, Iran, and uh, 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 Abu Allah uh, uh, Maududi in, in, in the Indian subcontinent, a variety of thinkers, when they de developed the principles of Islamism, they did it with one eye on the fascists and communists, but especially the fascists of Europe. And, 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 and they modeled it on those ideas. And in their notion, the idea was very much to reestablish Muhammad's empire, not to wait for the... You, you, for, for, but Paul, you, you can't throw Shiites and Sunnis into the same pot. You can't say that someone like Khomeini or Shariati is following Hassan al-Banna, who's a Sunni, and the others are Shiites. It, it simply is, is completely contrary to the ideological history of these of these movements. There, I, 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 I agree with you that there is an, an Islamism, but to say it started with Hassan al-Banna, you could take it back to Rashid Rida, you could take it back to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. There's a complex history there, it, and I think you're oversimplifying it in a way that is very adverse to people understanding what is actually going on. I think we have to make distinctions where distinctions have to be made, and between 
a, a radicalism in Sunni Islam and a radicalism in Shiite Islam. That's a distinction that we have to, to make. Plus, we have to recognize that there are many other modern forms of Islam that are not extremist. Uh, let me respond. Should we, can, uh, yeah, can you, and then we'll read the okay. two gentlemen are very patient. And I know there are, there are questions, but my response is yes and no. That, that, okay. that, that, Fine. That, 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 that the notion that, that there are many, many uh, versions of Islam that are not extremist, of course, that's my whole point. That's my point in drawing a distinction between Islamism, the, the political movement, and the religion of, of Islam. The, so I, I draw a complete distinction. On the Sunni Shiite uh, uh, thing, well, of course, there, there are uh, uh, tremendous denominational differences. But it is a fact, I believe, that the Islamism of Shiite uh, uh, Iran uh, arose out of the same inspirations as that of the Muslim Brotherhood. That uh, uh, somebody like Afghani, uh, who's the 19th century origin of this, uh, is 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 the an inspiration for both sources. When the Islamic uh, revolution took place in Iran in 1979. Why don't we, uh, the, why don't we continue on with this and yeah. another time? Because uh, I, I'm, I'm really growing impatient. Okay. Okay. If you like, I, 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 let's let the man come back to it. Let's right. let the There are factual questions. I'm only going to be a minute. Okay. <laughs> That's a group level interpretation. And I don't know. Well, which, which of these gentlemen is next? I was. I was. I was. Okay. You have the floor for your minute. I'm Herb <laughs> from Queens. And this discussion is uh, the reason I never wanted to be a liberal arts major. <laughs> I wanted to say that this is really a wonderful, wonderful discussion, but I'd like to make a point from a uh, very different point of view. If we were a bunch of um, dinosaurs and we were sitting around having a talk like what is going to disturb our system, uh, we would never guess what would happen to us. And sometimes it's a black swan event, to take a term from the fin finance, that is the most important thing. I remember Barbara Tuchman, in her middle age book, A Distant Mirror, I guess it is, pointing out that one third of Europe died because of a mouse, which really upset the apple cart because all the farmers <clears throat> went to the city because the cities really needed people to work in the cities. And that, as I recall from her book, was a really a major event. So I know that uh, you fellows could really have a great discussion from another point of view in terms of looking at society and its cohesion from events that are unpredictable. Although I really have to praise you for trying to look at this thing rationally. I really don't see how you could do it any other way than the way that you did it. And thank you very much. Okay. Uh, sir. Yeah, I only said my credentials. Yeah, my name is Ben Roth. I'm a psychoanalyst and a group therapist, and that's why I made a group intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and I did make a group intervention. And I did a lot of work around 911, and as a result of that work around 911, uh, I became a consultant to Stuyvesant in high school for about uh, a semester, uh, didn't do therapy, but essentially consulted with the people who were doing therapy and watched the forces at work at Stuyvesant High School following their evacuation. Uh, it's only significant that it led me to become interested in perpetrators, and I'll be giving a paper here in June on my work on the Holocaust from a group perspective. Um, and it, it is intriguing to me that the question of identity was ignored. Uh, and my nephew is a very well-known historian who was curator of the Freud Show. So I have a historian in my family, and we argue all the time. You have our sympathies. <laughs> yes, thank you. 
Uh, but the issue is, while everything seemed to be together approaching World War I, Freud was offering another idea that rationality uh, or the ego was not going to be the solution, that there were other forces at work uh, other than rationality, and particularly after World War I, he began to address violence, which I have tried to address. Uh, and it seems to me that and the main absence here is what you tried to bring into the discussion, was how violence occurs and why it occurs under certain conditions. And while we study the history, if, if psychoanalysts have an error in their lives as they don't, don't understand history, and if historians make a consistent error, they don't understand psychoanalytic theory. But I thought the point that you were making consistently was that when certain groups splint, splinter apart, violence ensues. And in that violence, which has been going on consistently, if you want, since uh, Cain and Abel, if you want to look back, somebody gets hurt. Somebody gets killed and somebody gets threatened. And this is a consistent event in group life, that uh, when false groups were created prior to World War I in the form of nations, they didn't last very long. They went to war against each other. Yugoslavia was a nation of six or seven different ethnic groups that was created at a particular time that splintered, and in the splintering, violence ensued, rather than having one sovereign leader, uh, and I'd like you all to address this if you can, rather than having one sovereign leader over a period of time, Tito was brought up at, uh, at one time. Once that leader disappeared, and once sovereignty disappeared, or the power of sovereignty as a group leader, as Freud suggested in this group paper, violence took place and lots of people got killed. And I think this is a constant in uh, human group evolution, or its failure, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Pam, do you want to uh, uh, one, one factor, um, before, or just in the initial stages of the U U Yugoslav War, uh, I did an interview with a, a liberal, a Serbian liberal, if you can believe there's such a thing, uh, a, hist a history professor who lamented this very fact that there was no leader who was going to stop this evil. There was no major figure. Um, the Misha Glenny, who I am a fan of, who's written persuasively and descriptively about the Yugoslav situation, in one of his books, he points out that Tito failed in that constitution that was written in 75 when they spread the leadership among various, uh, the, uh, among the various ethnic groups. And that was a recipe for disaster eventually, and it finally came. I, I uh, had either the privilege or misfortune, I don't know how you want to express it, to see and in some cases to meet some of the leaders who were involved in the um, um, destruction of Yugoslavia. And I must say the only person who impressed me as having any moral authority was Ibrahim Rogova, who was the Albanian uh, leader, the Kosovar, whose primary goal was to prevent people from being killed. That's all he wanted to do was he thought that on one hand, time was on his side, he did everything he could to prevent a wider war. And when he was marginalized, and I would argue with some of the help of people in the American government, including uh, Madeleine Albright, we saw the destruction that ensued with uh, the, 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 you know, sort of the final uh, push there uh, between the Serbs and the Albanians, and it, there was just, a, it, it is true, there was a lack of leadership and, and moral responsibility. He was one of the few people who tried to do something and then was marginalized. Did, do you think it was inevitable that 
you know, as our gentleman suggested, that that the that Yugoslavia was going to fall apart. I mean, on the one hand, it, Paul was saying that this is the seemed to be a country that was on on the right path, and now we look back and we say, well, it, well, it, it, it fell it apart is, with incredible well, violence. It was inevitable. It was true that um, uh, Tito you know, forcibly kept these people together. I mean, it was a dictatorship. I mean, uh, a relatively loose dictatorship, but it was it was a dictatorship. And it's good to remember that Franjo Tudjman and Ali Izetbegovic were both put in jail by Tito yeah. as being dangerous lunatic nationalists who should be removed from society. Well, you also worked in Turkey. Do you think that the Turkish-Kurdish issue is an inevitable source of violence that will continue? Uh, of course, I mean, the, I mean, there is just a tension there—a a, well, a cultural tension. I would so it's like. a basic contradiction of the notion of the nation, right. which well, is what, what, what you suggested. That's what I'm yeah. suggesting. Yeah. Well, I, I, all I, it's religion or the nation. I don't think matters in terms of mm -hmm. group identity. Okay. But I, if I can make just one point, my, what I was just trying to say is, I think we as a people sort of. And it occurred to me, I mean, even as a reporter, it sort of occurred to me, it's sort of a responsibility. How do you prevent this? I mean, maybe it's inevitable that you can. I had an argument with a very well-known British journalist, more of a discussion, Martin Bell, uh, a well-known British journalist, about in Tuzla, as we were doing sort of a death watch on Srebrenica. Uh, you know, uh, I, he was, most people accept that the, uh, it was inevitable that Yugoslavia would break up. I would argue that we should have tried harder. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah, just Mr. Berman, I'd be curious to know, do you have any opinion on whether Qutub's time in the United States radicalized him even more after he went back to Egypt? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, yes, I do have an opinion. Which, which <laughs> that, that uh, 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 Saeed Qutub came to the United States, and, it, and, it, and it's often said that his trip uh, to the United States uh, rad, uh, seriously radicalized him. I don't think so. Uh, and I, I don't think so because I've read some of, the, some of the things he'd written before he came to the United States. So I, I think that he arrived at his I, I, ideas for his own uh, reasons and, and, and his trip to the United States didn't actually um, influence him. A final comment from... Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You were the last one to speak, so why do you be? Well, only that in, in response to what Dan said, it seems to me, uh, would it be totally naive to be shifting attention to the United Nations and its complete Fair. failure in those kinds of situations? I mean, you know, you can talk about the diplomacy of uh, Washington and Berlin and so forth. Uh, you can talk about the internal dynamic uh, in, in, in the parts of Yugoslavia. The, the the abject failure of the United Nations there seems to be part of well, it's a fact. what we're yeah, dealing with. I don't know with, yeah. how to respond to it other than yeah. uh, But it's like, a, it's like a whole other level. Well, oh, it's like any human institution. It has to be, we have to renew it continually. Uh, I mean, it's, it, you can't, you know, watch thing and ex something and expect it to stay in motion. Mm -hmm. some, Paul, do you have I a final think, observation here? I have a final question, which, which, which is to ask, uh, you know, I covered uh, the Velvet Revolution uh, uh, for the Village Voice, and, and and Czechoslovakia also split apart, sure and, did. and 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 it split apart, you know, like a fine, like an okay divorce. It seems stupid to all observers why they would want to split, but they did, and it was okay, and and there are minority problems in uh, problems of minority populations in all the East East Bloc countries, Sorry. but only. In Yugoslavia, did this become uh, horrendous violence? So, is there a, is there a, a rational explanation why this one country dissolved into calamity and and the other countries did not? I would very just very briefly. I mean, if you want to talk about culture, it's the point in the world where three very dynamic, strong cultures came together. You had an East, Eastern Orthodox culture, you had a, a Western uh, Roman Catholic culture, and you had an Islamic culture. And, uh, and you had, you know, 600 years of conflict. It was just explosive. Uh, I mean, it's simplistic, but... And there was such hatreds. Uh, I remember, um, just very briefly, talking to a man in, in Vukovar who had taken over the radio station, a Croat, 
And I mean, again, my theme was, this is, this is not going to turn out well. And I said to him, uh, uh, what is going on here? I mean, they had pushed all the Serbs out of town. They had cleaned all the Serbs out of the, the radio station. This is going to end in conflict. And I said, um, he said to me, you don't understand. You don't understand what we've been through, how much we've suffered. I mean, there was no. That's yep. a standard uh, complaint. But I also, I, 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 in marriages too, by the way. Another area where we never went. <laughs> I just wanted to make one last observation that I thought of and I spoke out of the room. Go to the mic and we have to yeah. together. I made an observation before that Hirohito was left out and everybody was Eurocentric or looking in one direction and nobody really reflected on what happened in the Pacific and in Asia when we talked about facing uh, militaristic and uh, dictatorships. And it's kind of interesting uh, to, to be aware of this imbalance in the discussion. And I kept waiting for somebody to bring up Asia. Yeah. Let me, uh, you know, one final comment because it will then put us on the threshold of a completely different discussion, and that is that when you talk about Czechoslovakia broke up and okay, and Yugoslavia broke up not okay, uh, one thing we really haven't just, you know, put, what happens with the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Yeah. There have been so few wars. You have Georgia on the Abkhazia business, you have Chechnya, but, Chechnya. but by and large, um, yeah. That's worked phenomenally well, even though we, we hate to give the Russians credit for doing anything well. Um, it's, it, it's remarkable. And with that, I want to thank, thank, you, thank you very much. everyone there are books, in the book. Books for sale. Books for sale. Oh, there are books for sale. There, yeah. there are books for sale. By all the authors here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.